the first question and probably the most voted question is uh, for Omar. What brand was the perfume? <laughs> I know, I know. It's, I, was, I was too little at that, at that age. I didn't really differentiate in the names of perfume. I, I went to my mom's closet sometimes, sometimes to my father's closet, and tried to get the, the perfumes from there. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions we have is, what is the point of this event? And if you haven't realized it until now, you have to realize that you are very, very privileged to live in a country where we still have relative freedom. And with that, I ask Tufa the following question. Where did you get the force to bravely speak up against when a lot of people have the fear to do it? What would be your advice for those people who want to speak up, but they don't have the courage? Um, find yourself within your identity. Um, I think the courage to speak up has different dynamics and it takes time, but there's a lot of internal work that is needed. Get comfortable with yourself, with your identity and what role you play in the bigger picture in order to speak out. And you know, there's no time frame. It could be one year, 30 years, 40 years, it doesn't really matter. Whatever time period that you're comfortable within yourself to become an active participant by using your pain, to, be, to, to bring about change, do that then. But make sure you're comfortable within yourself and don't feel pressured to do so just because you've been violated. So courage comes from understanding oneself and realizing you have value in the bigger picture. You're as much of an active participant like everyone else. And a follow-up question to this one. Uh, have you been threatened by someone in your country for speaking out about your story? Definitely, um, by religious leaders, by uh, the military government as well. I have 24-hour security around my family every time, even as we speak now. So it is a threat because you're not only challenging powerful government, but you're challenging a cultural culture that does not speak out against violence. So you have to deal with people at an intimate level and at a, at a conservative level, but also against powerful governments like uh, the past regime and other powerful people that still continue to commit violence against women. Uh, I have a question for, for Chemi. Uh, how can we create more conscience as Guatemalans so that we have the strength to be able to fight for our human rights? I'm a firm believer that Existence is resistance. There is always these external powers that are bringing you down in many ways, whether it is in your very hyper-personal level, your community, your family, or locally, nationally, internationally. And when there are these bodies, and there are these bodies, even for Guatemala, there are various threats, right? I would say that China is a threat for many countries. And so when there are these threats, how do we rise above them? Is first realizing that your mere existence is resistance. You right. flourishing as a human is resistance. And then you build on that. In terms of building that strength, I find my strength from my community. I, whenever I feel down, I go back to my community, spend time with some of my elders, and I'm able to remind myself of why I do what I do and who I am and I have the spirit and courage to keep going, and I hope that applies to you as well. Thank you, Chemi. Uh, Omar, did you lose hope while you were in prison? If you lost it, how did you regain that hope? And as a follow-up question to that one, how do you forgive those people who hurt you, and how do you transform that pain into power? Because you're obviously an incredibly powerful speaker. <laughs> It's, it's a big question. Um, the, the first thing first, I lost hope more than I have hair on, uh, on my head. I lost hope in every time they were torturing me. I lost hope with everyone who died in front of me. I lost hope every time I, I, I was hungry and I was hungry all the time. I lost hope so many times during my year from 15 to 20. Uh, which is technically the age of most of you here. I was losing hope on a daily basis, but what can you, where, where can you gain hope if you are being tortured on a daily basis? 
The only thing you're seeing is people dying next to you and that your beloved ones are disappearing and your best friends are dying now and you have to make a best friend tomorrow and your best friend tomorrow will die and have a new one and that will die and knowing that you will die yourself. There was very few sources for hope except one very small factor during my time in prison. We, th that's how much space I had in prison. That's it. You sleep like this and you wake up like this. You, you can't lie on, on the ground. You can't. You're either like this or you're standing for three years, right? However, you don't have walls. What you have is you have people surrounding you. So we have people in front of me, so I have to switch every four hours. I sit for four hours, and I have to stand four hours to allow the person in front of me to sit. So one day when I came back from the torture, I had a scar. I, I was bleeding from my shoulder a lot. And the person next to me said, hey, man, I am, um, I'm a doctor. Let me, let me try to help you take care of your wounds so you don't die of infection. And uh, of course, yeah, they, he started to help me. And then after that, the guy to the other side started talking to me and he said, hey, I know we're going through a lot here. If you want to talk about it, let me know. I'm a psychologist. Interesting. We start talking about it. The guy in front of me was, uh, was a lawyer and he started talking about me. How can we build a dictator-free prison? How can we share our food equally? The guy behind me is an engineer. Talk to me about how messed up this building is. You know, so everybody had something so meaningful. So the day after when I go to the torture, questions started to pop up in my head. I have a very interesting question to ask the lawyer. The guard would be beating. Remember, I've been tortured for a very long time. Your skin has the ability to lose the feeling of pain over time. So at some point, they could be torturing you. You wouldn't be feeling it. You would be thinking about something totally different. So I would go back to myself super excited after the torture to ask this guy this question. The psychologist was a great friend. So during the time in prison, I handled, you know, all the trauma that was happening on a daily basis. So realizing that these guards are so brutal, but there's equal goodness of people next to me. And one fantastic thing we had in prison is we knew that we could die at any second. And if I ask you this question, if you know that you will die in one minute, if you're going to die in one minute, what is the last thing you want to do? A good thing or a bad thing? Answer. A good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. A good thing, right? So for three years, I know I will die next minute. So I was doing a good thing all the time. The same thing for a prisoner around me. So everybody was treating me very nicely, and I loved it. You know, I started to, to get hope from that. Going to the guards question, I don't want to be very long for you guys. You already heard a lot. Um, I always wondered, how could the guard who's torturing me, who knows that I'm innocent, enjoy torturing me? Because they were laughing. And for three years, hearing the guard laughing when they torture you, you can't distinguish when they are actually enjoying the torture and when they are just doing it. So I could feel at some time that the guards were enjoying torturing me. That question was in my head for three years. What makes you enjoy hurting other people? What is the fun part of that? So I was in Sweden after I, I was smuggled out of prison and I made it to Sweden later and I received a phone call. Um, and I, I picked the phone and um, I say, hi. And the other person says, hi. And when, 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 I, hear the, when I hear the voice, I recognize it. I heard it for years torturing me every single day. The guard was calling me because I spoke publicly about, about them in the news. So he called to threaten me. Do you want me to kill you or do you want money? What do you want to shut up? I said, you are exactly what I want to shut up. I have one simple question. If you answer it, that's all I want. And I would never talk about it. He said, what is this question? I said, what makes you enjoy hurting me when you knew that I'm innocent? What makes you enjoy killing my cousin in my hands when you know he was innocent? What's funny about that? Tell me. Convince me. He hung up and called me two minutes later. We had a 91 minutes conversation, fully recorded. The summary of this conversation, he says to me, when I became a guard in prison, I didn't want to torture people, but they forced me to. I had to, for to torture you. And if I, did, I refuse to torture you, I will be tortured myself. If I am to be tortured myself and put in prison, I would never be able to go back to my family. My family is a wife and four children. If I don't work, 
and do what exactly they want to do. I would never get my salary, go out to my family that need my help. So I am trying to protect my family. What is better in this world than protecting your family? It's a very noble thing. And when you're doing a noble thing, do you enjoy doing it or not? You do, because it's a great thing. So I am technically not torturing you. I am just protecting and providing my family. I'm doing a great thing, and I enjoy doing great things. You see, justifiable in a, in a survival mechanism in their head. Doesn't mean that his, his actions were right. It's, they are still wrong. But it's important we understand the other side. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand how they think in order for us to change the story, change the narrative, so we can win the battle. Yeah. Long answer, but... Yeah. Yeah. Excellent answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We like to ask tough questions here at UFM uh, because we want our students and our visitors to think critically. Mm -hmm. And we have a tough question for you, uh, Tufa. Do you believe moments or movements like Me Too have become a witch hunt where men are being put on trial by public opinion and not by law? Isn't this dangerous to freedom? Hmm. I think central to freedom is opinions first opinions by people that have survived a certain act of violence, and opinions of people that are observing the expression of that violence. So to me, I mean, I feel like the Me Too movement has been made a bit more nuanced than it was supposed to be. And I completely understand that at the center of it, especially in America, where voices of women that are a bit more privileged than I am are centered in that conversation, um, we are grateful that the Me Too movement is an opening and a gateway for the minority groups or the invisible survivors to speak up against survivors of violence, against their perpetrators, rather. Um, but the Me Too movement and the idea of speaking out against your perpetrators is beyond Hollywood, is beyond powerful people and powerful institutions. And when you look at the idea of speaking out against your perpetrator, only within the context of Hollywood and power structures, you miss out on the everyday experiences of everyday people that experience violence against other family members, their teachers, their colleagues, or their mates who are not as powerful. So to me, is when you think about the Me Too movement, not to only see the classic powerful position of the Me Too conversation, which is very privileged, in my opinion, but think about everyday people that you interact with, your cousins and your schoolmates and the people back home, and to think about what is their Me Too stories like. And unfortunately, because of the capitalist state and, and, and respect for higher hierarchies that we have, we tend to listen to survivors of violence, which is amazing because it opens a door, but you have to realize the privilege that comes with being a white, blonde-headed woman speaking from Hollywood, speaking from California, versus a woman speaking in Chad or Nigeria or Ethiopia from a very secluded rural area. Whatever nuances and conflictions you have against the bigger conversations on bigger stages like this, you cannot forget and cannot diminish the stories and experiences of violence against women in these other communities that are not considered central or are not considered white enough um, to be considered. So the Me Too movement can be very personal. You have the right to interpret it in the way and in your context that you understand. Within my community in the Gambia, when I stand up and say, Me Too, they don't know what I'm talking about, right? But when I, say, when I stand up and say, Mintung, when I stand up and say, tu fajalo, they understand the context of power dynamics and how abuse is sustained by other institutions and patriarchal systems uh, 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 um, of, of the way we live. So just personalize it, internalize it, investigate it. Um, do not be lost in the, the words. And, and, and all these different dynamics that come from very privileged positions, but make it nuanced for yourself. 
that it happens in our everyday life. It is subtle, it is verbal, it is practical, it is invisible, and it is visible. And it is a powerful tool used by powerful people at all different levels of ways of life, whether within democracies, dictatorships, and everyday ways of, of, of living. So have an open mind, listen to women that you think you can't listen to, not just because you're forced to listen to an interview by a woman that you perceived powerful enough to bring down another powerful man. And to understand violence is all about power. And that is why it is used as a tool in conflict. It is used as a tool by dictators. It is used as a tool in prisons. And it's always used within a power dynamic. And we must recognize power dynamics whenever we talk about violence against women. A quick follow-up question. Uh, would you agree that violence against anyone regardless of their sex, should be what we should strive for. Definitely. And, you know, I say this to my people every time. When you live in a culture where men are perceived as superior, where as a woman, your role is to cook and clean and get married and have kids and shut up. When you grow up in a culture like that, and men's role are supposed to be superior, they're supposed to be strong, and admitting that you've been violated as a man, whether you are a political prisoner, whether you are an everyday citizen that has been tortured and your private parts have been touched, electrocuted, it is very difficult to admit that when, in fact, an admittance of that violence means that you are less of a man because that is only supposed to happen to women. It means you're vulnerable, you're open to violence. As a man, how do you allow another man to touch your private part? How do you allow another man to electrocute your private part? But we cannot get to that phase within that culture if we cannot admit the people we deem vulnerable, the people we deem weak, that are women and girls, are not facing such violence. So for me, at the center of giving men and all other gender identifying people to admit that violence has been done to them is to admit that violence is being committed by the people we deem weakest within our society. Mm -hmm. Women admitting and fighting for their rights and justice against perpetrators gives room to men identifying folks to step up into the picture and say, I too have been violated. My private parts have been used as a tool of suppressing my voice. But until we pass those phases within cultures where women are deemed weak, we cannot get to a place where men can admit, I have been sodomized, I have been raped, and I have been violated. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. Thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is a question for all three, but uh, maybe Chemi, you, you would like to start with the answer. Uh, do you think that UN Security Council is effective at providing world peace as they are supposed to? As they're supposed to, the answer is no. These bodies and institutions were built so that they could protect. Um, but when they're not doing their job, it's important that the members, people like you and I, who place hope in that and allow for these type of institutions to exist, to be held accountable. Just because they're not doing their work, does that mean that we shouldn't have it? No. If they're not doing their work, the goal is to make it work, because there is a reason why we needed it in the first place. As you saw with the Tibetan movement, I shared as a victory, releasing a statement by the UN. But the last UN High Commissioner, Michelle Bachelet, within her whole term, she never mentioned the word Tibet. She even went to visit China, she did a report on East Turkestan Uyghurs, but she didn't even say the word Tibet. So UN High Commissioner from Chile, Michelle Bachelet, was absolutely quiet about Tibet. Why is that? So these are things that we need to continue asking, the questions of why, and hold them accountable. Yeah. From my, from my experience, the United Nations in general is the most disappointing institution I can talk about today. I, I never seen anything worse. Um, 
it's, it's an institution that's supposed to have power to save lives, the power to stop war. Now it's an institution that's like a toy. Russia is playing it, China is playing it all the time. Uh, it's not being used the, the proper way. However, the, the power that I believe in is, is you, the individuals. Um, and we have, we have the power to share our stories. We have the power to change the world. If I ask you, stand up if you have social media. Stand up if you have social media. Just stand up if you have social media. Social media. Only if you have social media, stand up. Everybody. <laughs> All right. All right. Raise your hand if you have Instagram. Raise your hand if you have TikTok. Raise your hand if you watch YouTube. Sit down if you feel hopeless and powerless. Mm. Sit down only if you feel hopeless and powerless. You see, most people are standing, so you feel powerful and hopeful because there's something you can do. There's something powerful. Feel free to sit down, please. You have the power to share your story. Everybody has a very powerful story to share with the world that has the potential. Your story has the potential to lead to things that can really please you very much. Never underestimate the power of the education you're receiving, the commitment of years of you being in school. Never estimate the important tiny step of you coming and talking to Robert, the vice president of your school, the president of the school, the teacher, the staff. Communicate with these people. See what you can do. The most powerful thing you can do is to understand what's going on in the world and to use the tiny talent you could have. So if you have a talent, you should always use it to help people who are suffering. Never use something you don't enjoy doing to help people. I love public speaking. I can do it forever. And I do it to help Syria, right? To help Ukraine, to help, to help you know, Tibet or Afghanistan or anyone who needs help, Ukraine today, right? But I never write an article to help Syria because I suck at writing and I hate it, right? I only do the things I love doing so I can do it for a very long time because war, corruption, all these problems, they take very long time. If we do one thing and we get tired, we fail. We have to be consistent and do things for a very long time. So what you need, everybody has a talent. Nobody has no talent. Everybody has a talent. Whether that's painting or physics or math or dancing or, you know, public speaking or writing or social media or anything, you can use these tools and this talent. You identify the talent you have and the tools that exist in your life and the cause you care about. You combine these three and you can be a fantastic human being in this world, contributing for a better world. <laughs> We have unfortunately run out of time for this uh, Q&A session, but I still have to uh, ask one question that was highly voted uh, by you, the audience, and that is uh, for Omar. Uh, have you fallen in love again? Ah, and where is she? I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I fall in love too much, uh, too easily. Uh, when, I, when I got to Sweden, I fell in love with a Norwegian girl. Oh. Uh, that removed every love I had before. You know, I stopped thinking about anything else. And then I loved someone from Sweden. And I, I forgot everything before that. Uh, you know, love is so powerful. It controls your mind. It makes you powerful. It makes you fight so hard to get what you think you deserve. So love is a power we should take advantage of to use it for a, for a, for a, for a good thing. So, yo, know, man, I loved so much. I love so many ladies. I met so many people in my life. I'm very social. I go to events. Can you imagine? To every speech I come, there's like a thousand people. At least 50 girls talk to me. And then at some point, you fall in love again and so on. Same trap all the time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Tufa. Thank you very much, Omar. Thank you. Omar. Thank you. Thank Chemi, you. thank you very much. <laughs> Antes. There's many types of love that's just beyond romantic relationships. You can love your community, you can love the people beside you, you can love the people that are also being mean to you. There's many types of love and I hope you will love unconditionally for the rest of your lives. Thank you. Thank you.